My pleasure to have Maria Marukian on the podcast today. And you're coming, we're, we're doing a live, so this will be on YouTube as well. Um, and Maria, you're president of MSM Global Consulting, um, whose mission is to help organisations develop and implement strategies to create a more equitable and inclusive global workforce and fuel lasting change, which is one of my passions as well. And you've got a really long track record, um, having, having served as a consultant, a coach, a facilitator, provided a lot of guidance around uh, um, to leaders and organisations on diversity, equity, inclusion, leadership development and organisational transformation. You've been featured, featured in Forbes and TD Magazine um, and your company was recognised as a top 10 diversity and inclusion company by Manager HR Magazine in 2022. So congratulations on that. That's wonderful. Um, and, and uh, you know, not that it doesn't um, stop there. You are also a podcast host, uh, and your podcast, Culture Stew, has gone into its fourth season. So, a really popular podcast. And you're an adjunct faculty at American University. And of course, um, you know, because in your spare time, you wrote a book. And so, you're an author of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Trainers Fostering DEI in the Workplace. And that came out in um, 2022. So, we'll put some links in show notes and, um, and in, in the um, be below this video as well. But that sounds like a lot. And that's why I love talking to people like you. It's such a privilege to meet really global thought leaders in the particularly in the area of diversity and inclusion really helping um, organizations and leaders transform but how did you get here where did you start maria so i think that i'll get i'll give sort of a brief backstory in terms of uh, my my upbringing because i think that it really started with my my childhood and the experiences that I had, as well as the stories that I heard from my family members. So I, I am US citizen, born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and I often tell people I grew up in a very prototypical white middle-class uh, upbringing and in my community looked you know, we all looked a lot alike. We spoke a lot alike. We worshiped <laughs> yeah, the same yeah, way. You know, yeah. there were a lot of similarities, a lot of homogeneity, even though Detroit is one of the most uh, racially, ethnically diverse uh, communities right, in, yes. in the United States. And it's deeply segregated. Mm. So um, some of the experiences that I had that I think uh, kind of forged my journey, one is that although on the outside, I looked just like most people in my community. I did come from a multicultural family, multilingual, uh, bicultural family. My father and his family members were refugees twice over, mm -hmm. uh, fleeing Istanbul, Turkey during the Armenian genocide, uh, landing in Cuba. So my dad actually was born and grew up in Havana. Oh, wow. And came to the U.S. when he was a young man. So a uh, very interesting sort of multicultural, multilingual experience that he had that he brought with him. And then he married my mother who grew up in a tiny little farming community in Northern Michigan where for generations, everybody and her first language, even though she was a fourth generation. Um, so uh, sort of melding of cultural identities, I think was very prevalent in my childhood and my upbringing. And my parents were both teachers, public school teachers, and they worked in, in inner city uh, schools in Detroit. So I think I had uh, this essence of the importance of understanding cultural identity. And I also had this exposure to significant racism that was occurring in the, you know, anti-Blackness in the United States, as well as socioeconomic divides. So as a kid, I didn't really get any of that, right? But somehow intrinsically my experience and perspectives, I think that really shaped my personal and my professional choices and definitely my career. Um, I've always felt drawn to focusing on the human side of organizations and the thinking about sort of the psychology uh, and and the sociology of organizations mm. and systems, and and I've always been deeply drawn to 
uh, culture and stories and sort of just the narratives and the way that people experience the world in such different ways and interpret one another and misinterpret one another yeah. um, quite often. Uh, and so I've, I've always felt like it is my, my purpose, my call to action to build those bridges to mm. create connections across mm. those different it's always fascinating to me because because uh, I'm a systems thinker as well, and and as you speak and you, and particularly as you describe sort of how you got here, that you know I have a migrant background in my history mm. as well, my my recent family history, and I think there's a sense that um, when when you've experienced some kind of marginalisation, there's a there's a sense of the the system that comes into play for you, not not for everyone, but I think, and, and I'm always interested in in how people get to that because it is, it's not just through experiencing marginalization. Um, some people get to that by just understanding their privilege as well, but it's really having, it's stepping away and almost looking at the matrix and saying, we are in a system that actually um, does not provide equal access to resources in society, to opportunities in society, to everyone, and um, and it's not about what people do individually. It's actually how the, what their role is um, as determined by that by the system structures and, and processes that that we're all some you know sometimes oblivious to. So thank you for that, Marie. I love that. It's and and, and very eclectic background. So. Um, uh, interesting, really interesting life that, 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 and you've come to such a, um, you know, a life of purpose and, um, and, and, and does that really drive you? Cause obviously you've got, you've got a family, you've got young children. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that drive you? Because you, you know, you, you, you achieved a lot, you've got, you're still achieving a lot. Yes. I, I think it, it absolutely does. Yeah. And I think what has been, very present for me, especially in the last, I would say, 12 years or so, it really since my, my first daughter was born, is that um, the, for me, the notion of, of professional and personal life is very melded together, uh, not only mm -hmm. because I am passionate about my work and I want to spend time uh, engaging mm. in it and, um, and continuously learning and challenging myself on a professional level, but also because I think that this work is so absolutely paramount, um, for us to be able to make the, make the world better for the next generation. Yeah. Um, and I am endlessly surprised and deeply, uh, appreciative of what I learn from my children at every stage of their, of their childhood. But, um, the, the ability that they have to take some of these concepts that we as adults seem to be struggling with so much and, and, and play with those ideas and, and bring compassion and, uh, their, their levels of emotional intelligence are off the charts. Um, so it is inspiring to mm. me. And I think, uh, also just constantly reinforces to me that I'm, I'm doing this work, not only for a paycheck, not only to be able to put these things on my resume, I'm doing it because it can help, uh, it can help open people's eyes up and hopefully yeah. make our systems more equitable for for my kids and for other mm, people's mm, kids. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now in and I in the US and there's there's quite um, quite a in some ways disturbing set of debates going on at times around um, diversity and equity um, inclusion training and other efforts and there's been some real um, you know some real in some ways. Um, backlash uh, arguments and we've seen a lot of um, retreats back into uh, you know from progress made over the 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 last you know the decades in um for example um the you know abortion debate and the access to um you know abortion in terms of women's rights but also there's been some real retreats in terms of i think um education around race in in um and and what schools are doing could you give us maria because you're you're much more you know immersed in that could you give us a bit of a broad sweep of what are the major things that you're a bit concerned about at the moment in the us mm -hmm. and i think we can learn um 
I think from in Australia we can learn from what's happening there because we are going through a process mm. of um, voting for a referendum to acknowledge our First Nations people in our constitution that we have never acknowledged and our First Nations people have been here for 60,000 years, you know, mm. um, and, um, and, and we're also voting on a, um, a voice which is a representation to our parliament of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So I think that, you know, we're experiencing some of these debates and particularly uh, in, in, in this country. So yeah, could you give us a broad sweep? Because I, I'm always a bit disturbed by what I hear, but then I meet people like you are really fighting the good fight as well. So, um, so yeah, so if you could give us your view, I think that would be fantastic. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So gosh, I wish we had several hours <laughs> to dive deep into this, but um, it, you know, sh uh, short version, I think that there are a couple of things that are um, really present uh, in, in terms of the, the challenges that we're experiencing as a, as a country and, and in particular what we DEI practitioners are seeing. And first and foremost, the backlash against equity against uh, even having conversations about the uh, the multiple truths of our shared history as a country. Um, I think that the the that backlash, to be quite honest, was expected. Uh, we have seen this before. Anytime that there is some sort of a catalyst for social progress and change, um, especially when it comes to civil rights there is inevitably uh, a backlash to that. And we've seen it, it's cyclical. So I think for many of us as practitioners, we were just waiting <laughs> for this to, to, to happen. And I think we're still in the throes of it. Um, the, and I don't think that, yes, absolutely. There have been significant, uh, you know, um, there's been backpedaling, right? There have been, uh, there has been regression in a number of, places in terms of, you know, Roe versus Wade uh, being overturned in terms of some of the uh, state uh, legislation that has been increasingly happening in mostly conservative states around um, what is taught in public schools. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's frightening in a lot of ways because the level of censorship that is happening and the fear that that is stilling in educators librarians, academics, um, uh, government leaders at, you know, at every level from municipal to federal. So I think that there are some really significant challenges um, that are coming about because of some of the legislative changes. And there are also, as there always have been, really pe people who are much smarter than I am, who can figure out the, the loopholes, the workarounds, the ways to continue to do the work that needs to be done despite some of these setbacks. What I am most concerned about and what a lot of political scientists uh, in the United States are concerned about is uh, the, the level of polarization and the, the vitriol that is coming with that, that societal and ideological polarization that we really have not seen in our country um, ever, in at least in modern history, for um, at, to this extent, and it's been happening increasingly for decades. Um, but it's really hit a fever pitch, and um, this uh, political scientists actually have a name for this. They call it pernicious polarization, and pernicious polarization occurs when people who uh, begin to connect their ideological beliefs with their identities. So the two become intrinsically connected. And when we do that, it becomes harder and harder for us to be able to find common ground, uh, to be able to even have conversations where we listen to that may be different from our own. And we increasingly seek out people who reinforce our existing beliefs. Um, the ch and, and that erodes our democracy over time, uh, because what we're seeing is that not only do we say I'm right and you're wrong, but increasingly it's leading to at the societal level, at the community level, 
people from one side of the ideological spectrum looking at the anyone who opposes their views as um, immoral and ignorant and dangerous and untrustworthy. And so that's what the political scientists have been, uh, you know, sort of raising the, the, the alarm around because there is no uh, democracy in the world to, to at this point that has um, existed with such an extent of polarization as what have, what we're experiencing in the United States and, and been able to walk back from that. So we're in really dire straits um, as a society. And, and I think that um, I, what I'm hearing now is yes, there's the backlash and yes, there's the, you know, there continue to be, um, uh, you know, there continue to be a, a lot of uh, mis, a lot of mis, mistruths really for lack of a better, better, you know, phrase and falsehoods that are being um, put out there. But what I'm also hearing is many people across, across the United States from every every part of the political spectrum saying we're we we need to come together we yeah. are exhausted mm. and we're tired of being it's not sustainable at, at war with each other and we want to be in community we yeah. want a more um holistic society but we don't even know how to get there anymore um so i think that's we're at a critical stage where there's still an opportunity for us to rebuild that sense of who we are but um it's it's going to take a lot of work all right so we're at a real juncture yeah in yeah. in terms of um you know intervening at that stage or facing the consequences which which in some ways you're he you're hearing nobody wants so so that realization perhaps is giving you a little bit of hope there it sounds yeah. like yeah and 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 yes. maria what's what's the role of of the dni practitioner you know what what are you doing or perhaps what are you seeing your colleagues doing particularly in organizations because um you know we can impact society at large through um you know organizations individual by individual or team by team so what what, what do you think the role is there I think that uh, DNI practitioners play an absolutely critical role in terms of being able to bring those bring those opposing views together mm -hmm. and to create spaces where it is not only acceptable but encouraged to explore these uncomfortable topics and to see that as a an important part of building community within our organizations. Um, and so I think a lot of times, you know, there's been this, this sort of notion that we leave our feelings outside, we leave our, you know, our political beliefs outside, yes. just come in and do your work. And then that, that lives in your personal mm. life. But um, we can say that all we want, but people are bringing that, yeah. whether it is safe for them to share it or not is, is another thing. Um, and so I think DNI practitioners can play an absolutely important role in terms of um, creating that space for people to realize mm -hmm. that, you know, when we sit down and have a conversation with each other and we talk about what we really think and feel and believe, we actually find that we have more in common mm -hmm. than we originally thought. And we start to humanize one another again. We start to listen because we feel listened mm -hmm. to. And even if we walk away still vehemently disagreeing, we are connected and we have we have respect and we honor one another um it also becomes easier when we create those spaces for people to um honestly respond and provide feedback when somebody does engage in uh, any sort of behavior that causes harm yeah and it's easier for the people who cause that harm to receive that feedback mm -hmm. without becoming defensive i think what is um, so challenging right now when it comes to even, I mean, even saying the words, it's become such a, a trigger word, right? It's mm. become um, this concept that is either, uh, oh, that's meant to divide us. We don't talk about that, right? Or it's actually exclusionary if we talk about equity and inclusion. Yes. Um, so I think there's a lot of misunderstanding of what, what these terms really mean and who they serve. Mm. And so I think DNI practitioners uh, have a critical role in being able to deconstruct 
these concepts so that people see themselves reflected in it. Yeah. So it's a really that uh, it's, it's opening dialogue and opening spaces for dialogue. Um, and, and I think you're right. I think sometimes we don't go into dialogue because we don't know the answers or do, or we do, or we avoid the conflict. And, um, and so what you're saying is go into open dialogue anyway. How do you do that in organizations? Can you maybe describe some things that have worked before or some tactics that you recommend? Sure. So uh, one of the most uh, profound experiences that I've had was um, I partnered with some colleagues who uh, actually use psychodrama and theater as a means mm. for uh, yeah. engaging folks in dialogue. And so they, and we did this all virtually because it was in the middle oh, of the wow. pandemic. And um, so we did what's called playback theater, where we brought a group of people together from an organization. And we asked them to take a few moments and think about, and then share an, an experience, right? We mm -hmm. asked them, you know, some specific kind of pro questions to um, to probe the, the story. And then, and then we actually, had some volunteers who shared their story with the group and the actors then played back the stories. And it sounds so simple. It was really, it was deeply moving mm. and it was an, an incredible experience for in this particular context, the, the reactions from the audience when we pulled people and asked them afterwards, what was that like for you? What yeah. feelings did you experience listening to this person's story be shared? Mm. And in this particular situation, we were centering a lot of it on racism in, yeah. in this particular industry. That we're doing with. And the, what was asking it's sort of an, an additional aha moment for a lot of the participants was that most of the white participants reacted with this shock. And yeah. I, oh my, and, and I feel guilty. I feel guilty that I didn't know this. Mm -mm. I also feel appreciative that we're having this conversation. And for the, the people of color in the room, um, to them, it was more, uh, yeah, of course. Right. I mean, I feel, I feel seen because I know that others yeah. have experienced the same harm that I have, but I'm not coming out of this experience yet with a sense of, um, that I've learned anything new mm -mm. or necessarily that I trust that things will change. Yeah. That was a powerful moment, I think, for the white folks in the room who came out of the saying, this was so great. Yes. And then to hear their colleagues say, what, what's coming after this? That's yeah. what I care about. Yeah. Um, so it led to some really important uh, actionable work yeah, that I came after that. that. And there's some really interesting research that backs this up that, you know, there's a lot that's been talked about how DEI training is not necessarily uh, very effective mm -mm. and, uh, you know, is a huge, um, a huge financial uh, burden for a lot of organizations without a lot of return on investment that they can see. And um, some of the research that's come out indicates that the type of training that does work centers itself on perspective taking mm -mm. through storytelling through giving people opportunities to share and learn and humanize and having some sort of a call to action yeah the so what now what hey we have this heightened awareness we have this connection with each other we recognize that these biases are having an yes. impact on us and others what do we do now that's right and so if we don't focus on the what we do now and give people something that they can actually take mm. and practice in their day-to-day -day lives, then yeah, this work sort of dies on the vine. Yeah, I, I feel like I feel like DNI training has had a bad rap because it's almost like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Because yeah. to your point, the reason why it's probably not had a, an effect is because you've had that lack of action from the organisation who need to commit at a real senior level. You know, if your top team, if your top team isn't committed to act to, to action or to really making some um, progress on on DNI, then you can't expect a training program to affect that change without you know enacting that social change from from leadership all the way down so you're absolutely right there mm -hmm. what um what in particular could um organizations 
do you know, you know today if, if you've got people listening today that are thinking what could I do what's the first thing I could do what what would be what would be the you know the top three things or the the recommended things you, that organizations could do today to really help open up that dialogue um, and it might be you know to your point you know have have an expert in who, who can help you with that but but you know within sort of limited resources I guess I'm thinking about you know what what can people do sure. Uh, so a couple of things, ideally starting with some sort of data gathering process, and that doesn't necessarily have to be a big, mm. substantial, you know, uh, assessment, although that's, if possible, that's a, the best way to yeah. get, you know, all of the data. But even if it's just um, some sort of informal town hall Mm. where you're polling people and asking them to share their experiences anonymously yeah. um, or adding in some questions if they don't already exist in any sort of employee engagement surveys uh, or workplace culture assessments that are already in the, mm -mm. you know, in the rotation in the organization. So I think the more that you can integrate it into what already exists, yeah. Um, that's really helpful. And because we need to get that data, what often happens is that senior leaders will contact me and they'll say, okay, we're not exactly sure what we need to do, but we want to do something. And I'll, I'll begin with, by asking them, what are the pain points? And more often than not, they, they will say, oh, well, things are pretty good here. <laughs> Maybe we have a couple of issues. Maybe we don't have as much representation at the senior levels yeah. as we want, but for the most part, you know, and I'll I hear that a lot with, too, right? Let me talk with some of the employees, um, and it's and and they are often shocked and uh, and and frustrated and sometimes defensive when they do get the the data back that shows them that not everyone is having this happy peachy experience. Yeah. In fact, some people are really struggling and have been for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So. Any way to capture that those stories, I think, is really important to mm -hmm. as a starting point. Um, secondly, uh, it has to start with leadership. People in those highly visible power positions have to do their own work and recognize that they play such a significant role in uh, determining and sustaining the organizational culture that either uh, helps or hinders. Uh, people's ability to really thrive within that organization. Mm. And so that, that takes time, I think, because all of us believe ourselves and we are, we're well-intentioned, yes, yeah. thoughtful, kind humans, and we all see ourselves that way and see our actions through that lens, but not everyone is experiencing mm. us or the organizational culture in that way. And so I think take some humility to acknowledge it, yeah. but um, it's really important. Yeah. So um, those are a couple I could go on, but those are the two that I would suggest. I just had a lag, so I'm just going to stop for a second. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, thank you, Maria. I think that they're really, they're really great suggestions and really good recommendations. I think you, you touched on this earlier. I think partly the problem is that that people in privilege a need to recognize that the systems that advantaged them in other words the systems that got them to the, that position of privilege are also the mm -hmm. systems that we need to disrupt and change and i think that's a really difficult um realization a difficult insight to make and even if you make that insight what do you do about it because it affects you as the person you know who's who's benefiting from your position in that system. And then secondly, it's how do, how do you cope with that? Perhaps, you know, you touched on it before, feelings of guilt um, and maybe even shame because, and, mm -hmm. and I, I've, you know, do you have any insights there um, based on sort of what, particularly I think, because in, a, in the US um, you've been grappling with that around, particularly mm -hmm. around race um, and equity there. And perhaps there's some, some things we can learn from you around that. For us, it is defensiveness and anger, right? You know, what are you telling me? I have privilege. I, I don't, I, I've struggled, you know, in, in so many ways to, to get where I have today. So how, mm. who are you to tell me my story? Yes. And I think that's valid. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we tend to paint people with 
the same narrow brush mm -hmm. that we're accusing them of painting us yeah. with. And um, it's, it, it's deeply human. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's part of our conditioning, our social identity <laughs> grouping. Um, so I think we have to find ways to override that. And, you know, something as simple as telling people you're all biased is not going to do it. Mm. Right. Um, but giving people opportunities, these little mental and psychological nudges to reshape the way that they are looking yeah. at these issues is really important. And so there's easy ways for us to do that, even just in terms of putting in some questions uh, into our decision-making processes with our team. Yes. Whose voice is not yes. represented here? And how do we get those voices? Mm -mm. And what would be the value to us mm. if we include those voices? Yeah. So rather than it being uh, a finger wagging, yeah. what is possible? Um, I just read a book called Inclusion Nudges. And what I like about it is it's a very practical, deceptively simple guide um, with just tools that we can introduce into our day-to-day -to, -day mm. to really embed DEI into the, the DNA of the organization. That's mm. a lot of acronyms, right? But um, something as simple as when we're looking at candidate selection, yeah, either somebody coming in from uh, for a new position or promoting others, rather than starting with who's the one ideal qualified candidate and why, saying all of these candidates are qualified. So why not mm, them? Mm, mm. And there's something about shifting that thinking to explore the, the potential value of each of these individuals, including those that don't fit the proverbial norm. Yes. Yeah, I love that. That gives us a new way of thinking. Yeah. Um, rather than looking for culture fit, looking for um, what is the culture that we want and who mm -mm. can contribute to that? Yeah. Um, so small things that I think we can be doing that mm. have a significant impact on the long-term sustainability mm. of this work. Mm. And it makes it feel more digestible because yes. I think folks are just, especially for those who are coming from a place of, I feel great shame and guilt. What do I do with this? Yes. I don't want to feel this anymore. Yeah. And so then they either get stuck there and fall into the place of feeling defensive and I give up no matter what I do, I'm going to be, you know, punished for it. Mm -mm -mm. And so they draw back or, uh, you know, or people just get, you know, kind of get stuck in that they become fatigued, right? I'm, I'm burnt out. I don't yes. know what else to do. Yeah. And it so, seems like um, a, a too, to the problem is too big to deal with. Yeah. And this is the problems with when we, because, because it's a, what we're dealing with are systems level problems, but we need to yes. tackle those problems at the individual and, you know, so it's social relationship level. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that it's easy. And that doesn't mean that just do this one thing and it will fix everything. But it's what nation on small things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Maria, thank you for that. I, I wanted to just check though. So you, so you wrote a book in 2022. Tell me a little bit about the book. Have we covered some of the themes in the book or was there other things that, you know, were really sort of we, you, we, the insights that you gained from writing the book? Were there other things that you'd want to share? Thank you. Yes. So the book Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for Trainers, uh, Fostering DEI in the Workplace was um, it, it was published by ATD, uh, the Association for Talent Development. And so the, the initial focus in the audience was professional trainers mm. and talent development right. practitioners. Um, and I really wrote the book thinking about what do I wish somebody had told me when I first yeah. started doing this work? And I wanted it to be a practical guide for anybody, regardless of where they are in their developmental stage mm -hmm. of this work. Um, what has been profoundly uh, exciting, I guess, for lack of a better word for me, is the, the output of, uh, of people coming forth who are not trainers, who mm -hmm. are not in talent development, yeah who are either the accidental trainers who volunteered themselves because they care yeah. about this or the people who are, they're trying to make change happen in their organization from a leadership level, a management level, a contributor level, and they have found value mm. in reading the book and using what it's providing. So right. that's been really great to see that it is 
it serves a broader audience and a broader group than I had originally anticipated. Um, I think one thing that we haven't really talked about too deeply in our conversation today, but I do cover in the book is um, we, you know, there are similarities and there are differences when it comes to doing DEI in a global setting. And so I do devote a chapter of the book to, okay, you know, we often hear about DEI with this very US centric mm -hmm. lens, um, but how do we also integrate uh, intercultural um, you know, communications yes. and, and, and concepts into this work and recognize, uh, yes, absolutely, this work is needed universally. Although universally, I think this work is necessary. It needs to look different. We need to integrate intercultural concepts and communication and really think about and uh, design for these different cultural contexts in mm. which we may find ourselves. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, in, in the work that I do, I'm often um, doing that work as well because there's, in Australia in particular, there's, um, we often deal with, levels of difference that are around the multicultural population that we have because we have a, quite a, a you know a vast history of migration here so yeah so that, that that's that's interesting that you have that chapter in the book um well thank you maria let's uh, i'm sure we will have another conversation it's been so great to meet you i'll put all the links in the show notes and, and we'll we'll refer to to your publication as well so if, um so if anyone wants to um grab that they can but where can people find you what's the best place to find you absolutely so my website is www.msmglobalconsulting.com right. Uh, I would also invite people to, um, you can sign up for our newsletter. We have a monthly newsletter uh, through the website. LinkedIn is probably one of the places where I spend the most time in yeah. terms of social media, um, connecting with other DEI practitioners and sharing some of our experiences and practices. And then of course, our podcast, Culture Stew, um, which uh, very similarly, I think to, to this podcast yeah. focuses on these issues from a storytelling lens, mm. um, exploring sort of the multi-dimensional aspects of identity. So people can find Culture Stew Great. anywhere where they get their podcasts as well. Yeah, fabulous. All right, thank you so much, Maria. It was lovely to have you here. Thank you for the very compelling conversation and hopefully we can do it again. Thank you, Josephine. All right. Bye.